being transparent with markups is really important because there are some industry standards that you can follow with that. And if people question it, you can say, you can fall back on the idea that that is the industry standard. That's what everybody else is going to charge you to, whether they're admitting to it or not. This is On Camera, On Brand, a show for professionals who want to look good on camera, but don't have the time or expertise to turn their office into a Hollywood studio. In each episode, Rob Rusher uncovers how professionals can get the most from their home or office setups. If you invest the time to share your stories on camera, you should be on brand. Everyone, welcome. This is a special episode. We're doing an in-person podcast. This is my good friend, Andy, collaborator, commercial director. And one of the things I wanted Andy to help me answer, a question I've seen, especially on LinkedIn a lot, is how much does video cost? How much does it cost to do a commercial? Maybe you have an internal crew, but there are some big wigs or there's a big event coming. So it's like, let's just hire some local professionals that this is what they do, make it look good. We get that a lot. So I figure we could kind of go through that. Yeah. Well, budget. <laughs> Thanks, <man. laughs> Budgeting is something that not a lot of people talk about. I feel like a lot of times people and companies aren't very transparent with their budgeting. So I love the idea that we're hopefully going to break down some of almost those walls a little bit uh, to to really kind of explain budgeting and sort of from both of our experience as producers in life, maybe talking a little bit about hard numbers and why your money is going where. Yeah. So just to set this up to so people don't think I'm a crazy person who just walked in off the street. As you said, we've well. col- <laughs> <laughs> as you said, you know, you and I have collaborated numerous times over the years in that director DP relationship. But to take it a step further, I am a freelance commercial director. I've been doing that for a number of years. And probably since about 2019, I've ran my own production company, Dessert Before Dinner. We specialize in comedy, absurdist, kind of playful, upbeat spots. And occasionally we'll do, as you've done with me, those cinematic, docu-style, lifestyle, real people spots as well. But from a budgeting standpoint, you know, even though I've worn the director hat many times, both you and I have worn that producer hat where we've collaborated with an agency or direct to client. We've made a budget for them had those back and forth conversations about the budget, a lot of times defending the budget, and then have spent the budget on set, have had to make changes, have had to pivot at the last minute. So you and I, I think, both have a really nice understanding, quite frankly, on even the small and mid-sized commercial production space of where money goes and why it's important to allocate money where you're allocating it. Yeah. And maybe we can even start with, it's almost a game, you know, of the budget thing, because it seems like in some ways, and and like you mentioned, we've been on both sides. So I think that gives a good outlook because you can kind of see the arguments or cases on each side. But on one side, it's like if you're the agency, the marketing department, it's like, well, I want to spend the least amount as possible to get it done because then I have other money to add, you know, pay for ads or Right. You know, other social media or additional content we could pay for, get more things edited. And then on a production standpoint, it's like, well, I'm, I'm not just trying to take the biggest money so I get paid more. A lot of times that money is not going into one of our pockets. It's like yep. we're getting a bigger grip truck to make things easier. We're getting the assistant art director. So our one art director doesn't do five rooms in one day. So it's it's almost those. But why do you think sometimes there is that like barrier to even get the conversation openly started about money? A couple of reasons. I think a lot of times when there is more of a guard up to talking about money with commercials from a client or agency side, I think sometimes it comes down to perhaps them not knowing what they actually want to achieve. Mm. So if your goals as a company are a little foggy, I feel like the budget suddenly becomes foggy as well. I also think sometimes from talking about numbers on the production side of things with actual crew people or the people working in it, I think sometimes there's no no transparency with numbers because I feel like sometimes people are just really guarded about their day rates or about how much they're spending because maybe they're doing it cheaper than they'd like to admit a lot of times 
Or maybe they're doing it more expensive than they'd like to admit, and they don't want anybody to know about it because they don't want maybe other companies to undercut them. One thing that really sucks a lot of times about rates and about budgets are when it when people try to undercut one another in this business. You know, take a town like Pittsburgh, where we're both located, when there's sort of a unified front on a day rate, it helps everybody, right? Because then everybody's getting roughly the same type of rate, and it's almost like when out-of-town companies come in, everybody's getting their fair share. I really like transparency in budgets and in day rates and things like that because I always think it helps everybody. Mm. On the company side, the client side, a lot of times, especially if it's your first time out with doing video, you as a client might not know the sort of in-the-weeds spending of where and why money's being spent on your production. You know you want a video. You know maybe you want one or two 30-second spots that you're going to only use across social. You might have those things lined up, but you don't exactly have the knowledge of what money is being spent on where when it comes to production because it's not your job to know what gear the sound guy should show up to on set with or what type of grip truck you need. You're relying on your production company that you're hiring to hopefully keep things fair. So yeah, a lot of times I think it's just a lack of knowledge about why your money is being spent where. Yeah, and gear is definitely a big, big thing because we've done jobs where we've had multiple grip trucks and we've had some where I just pack what I can pack in my forefronter <laughs> with a camera and a couple lights and it does just as good of a job. So why don't we jump into like, and we can continue the conversation, but I, I would love to even get into some of the numbers and the grittiness of, you know, actually what this looks like. So. Let's say almost as like the stage one production, like I said, you have the space in your office, your yeah. corporate company, and you just have a few of your higher up people together. You want to do those typical interview and then B-roll. So, hey, from 9, 9 a.m. to noon, we have these people scheduled and we have some B-roll scenes you guys can shoot in our office. And then, you know, from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m., we have the three interview slots or vice right. versa. Yeah. And and. I think even before that, you as a company really need to know what types of videos you're hoping to walk away from this, the usage, where it's going to end up. And that's going to affect how you or I as producers would scale this or quote this. Another thing that happens that I think it's important is there are a couple of different types of entry points to how a client or a company would approach a budget. So even before we put out that hypothetical scenario of sure. the interviews, some clients come to us and they say, I have $50,000, what is that gonna buy me, mm, right? Okay. Some clients come and say, well, I know I need two 30 second videos featuring three interviews with the CEO included and we want some B-roll, like the scenario you put out there. How much is that gonna cost? And some companies, and I like this the best, will say, you know, based on our marketing budgets, we've got anywhere from fifty to a hundred thousand dollars to spend. We know roughly what that could get us. What can you do with that? Because then not only can we make the budget within those goalposts, but we can maybe finagle what they're actually going to get out of that. Maybe they're going to get a couple more outputs that they didn't realize or a couple more things for social because it works within that budget. So taking your scenario. Some B-roll at the front half of the day, a couple of interviews at the back half of the day. Let's pretend they're local to mm -hmm. Pittsburgh, which yeah. is important, right, from the budget. And they're going to use this stuff in B2B marketing, cut up a couple of things for social. We're doing the post on it as well. So kind of a low to mid-size project is maybe a good way to put it. So off the top of my head, I'm instantly thinking, what do I need crew-wise to accomplish this? To actually, like, boots on the ground, like, what... Who do I need there on set yeah. with me? I need myself as a director. I probably need a DP with gear. So director of photography for those that don't know. So <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, no, um, it's all good. I think we're going to need some lighting with the interviews. The B-roll after talking to the client feels like it's a little more run and gun because uh, maybe their business is open and we're working around existing people in the business. So that can be a little looser, but then at the back half of the day, we'll have more control over those interviews. 
So the director of photography is going to need an assistant camera because we're running around a little bit. So that's going to tell me that's a position we need. We're going to need lighting, so we'll need a gaffer. The business that we're filming in is pretty accessible. It's easy. It's got a lot of open spaces. So I think we just need one grip for this one. We probably need a PA, a production assistant, just to help us, you know, wrangle people and things like that. The company's pretty buttoned up, so we don't need a producer on set, I think is important. That's one that sometimes goes either way. Depends how many crew people you have, how many interviews you're doing. This sounds like the company's under control. Yeah. They know yeah. what they're doing. <laughs> they're going to show up when they need to show up. We need sound with gear because we're doing these interviews. Yeah, especially B-roll, you want sound. Because it's one thing to set up a microphone when no one's moving. But yeah. for me, that's always when I get into, okay, definitely need someone else to handle. If you want people walking and talking, you're doing yeah. different B-roll scenes. You know, right. they, you want to jump into a meeting, but quickly lob them up so you can get those sound bites. That's sure. Let's pretend the business is a manufacturing business. Sure. They manufacture plaster casts of hands for no reason at all. Just to do it. Yeah. So there's a lot of machinery. So we will want that sound for the B-roll. Things like that always go into our decisions for why we hire who we hire. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll want sound. Um, the business is already set. We're not manufacturing scenes. We're not yeah. making up scenes yeah, of them just, molding these hands. Totally. So we don't need art or anything like that. We don't need props, but there's a lot of people that we're filming. There's a ton of people that we're going to capture. So I'm going to want a second PA to just be in charge of releases, of uh, organizing lunch, and then have another PA really with us as maybe a second set of hands. Yeah, like grab batteries and stuff. also be a client position I've done too. But really? You just have to make sure, well, to handle releases. Like oh, a person who set. works for the business. Yeah, but it has to be like, that's what you're doing. Because like sure. your example, it depends on how many people you're filming. I've been in the situation where it's like, you had three releases at the end of the day. And then I produce like doc stuff where it's like, you have like 30 plus releases. Right. You need a PA a for that. Yeah, yeah, you need someone just focused right. on, on that. And then I think that's it for something this size. So then what I'm doing is I'm taking those people's rates. Again, I know we're filming in Pittsburgh for this example. I'm going to take those people's rates, line item all of them. I'm going to mark everything up because I, as a production company, need to make money. I might add a percentage for insurance on top of that. And then that's my quote. So then I'm going to turn that over. Are we, are we factoring in post-production for this or no? Oh, well, we can start with just the crew side, maybe just like the just production. production for now. Yeah, because sure. that's a little separate. Yeah. We can get into that at the end, though, if you want. So then I'm going to present that quote to the client. Now, personally speaking, I always put forth, I guess what I would call a bid sheet. So it tells the client exactly what they're getting. You're getting one day of production. You're going to get us for 10 hours that day. You're going to get these crew people who are going to show up on set. You're going to get this many pre-production hours or a rough estimate of this many meetings. You're going to get a location scout, and that's going to include the, these people who are going to show up to the scout. I really try to lay it all out there so everything's really transparent and they know exactly what they're getting for their money. Mm -hmm. I feel like when you don't do that is when problems come up. When you're not so transparent with where exactly. the money's going. Not only that, but like when you don't set expectations I find that there's always something that comes up either on my end with crew people or on the client's end with something that they or I assumed that wasn't written out. So I think on that bid like sheet. Like who's buying lunch? Yeah, I mean, kind of, honestly. That's my first concern. And am I buying lunch for your entire company? There's a, lot of, there's a lot of people who are manufacturing those hands <laughs> who are going to want salads that day from, yeah. you know, for lunch. And am I paying for that suddenly? I know that sounds silly, but it genuinely adds up and you really need to be up, up front about that. I actually always have in there full breakfast and lunch for everyone involved in the production. I'll say something like that. I'll be really specific with it. All of those minute things that you might think you're maybe bothering the client with, you're not. You're helping them and you're helping yourself. Yeah. That's what it always comes down to with money. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, honestly, it's one, I think I've told you this before, I've told other people, but 
you've taught me a lot on like client services just from yeah, working with absolutely. you and like taking the time even when we're tired we fly down to a job in florida it's like that night you're going to costco or wherever to get crafty and or sending a pa to do it yeah, yeah. well i mean it the budget's not there i guess my point is like you find uh you put a lot of importance on not just what the video ends up being in right. the production but, but the like experience the experience yeah. yeah do you think that has an effect on getting hired again and continuing to work with Ab clients absolutely because people are not just buying the product they're also buying you and the things you're bringing to the table with that i always am a firm believer of that and so all of those pre-interviews you're doing sort of the face you're putting out there to them and like you said the experience that they have on set is all part of that process on a really big budget, big production where I, as the production company, am coming in and we're hiring a freelance director and we have crews up in the 40, 50s numbers. You know, that's where we do have a craft services person and we have obviously specific meals and it really balloons out there. But I guess the point to this is on those really low budget ones where there's like five or six crew and we're rolling into another city and it's sort of a little more run and gun, you can still give people a good client experience for not that much money. It's so important to allocate money to that. I think though, going back to the budgeting aspect of it, you just really want to be upfront with your clients about where their money is being spent. And I sometimes people hide how much they as the production company are making to the client. I, I believe the opposite. I think being transparent with markups is really important because there are some industry standards that you can follow with that. And if people question it, you can say, you can fall back on the idea that that is the industry standard. That's what everybody else is going to charge you to, whether they're admitting to it or not. Okay. So let's say we're in the budgeting stage, the client gets it and they either say no, or they say, no, we were thinking this. How do you handle that? And then to take it a step further, at what point do you walk away from the job or decide this is not, this is not the right fit? That's when you mail the marketing person a bag of cocaine, a delicious cake, and say, please accept this budget. Oh, wow. So if a client pushes back, uh, you know, on the budget that you quoted them, there's a couple of different ways to handle it. But again, you were transparent with your budget, so you've already kind of broken down that first wall, hypothetically. It's not about doing the job for cheaper, but I always feel like it's about giving them perhaps the budget that they asked for, but showing them what they are or not getting. We can work with any budget. You're just not going to maybe get what you need or want. Mm -hmm. So I found that when a client comes back and they are pushing back against the quote that I've given them, if we talk, we can sometimes collaborate to figure out where we can, you know, kind of get people out or, or scale things down to maybe fit within the budget that they want. Now, obviously, if we're at wildly different ends of the spectrum, right, using our hands example, I quote them around 50K for this interview day, and then they come back and say, well, we've got more like 15K. We're probably not going to come to an agreement here on that. Uh, I've had it where I've recommended other people for jobs based on them coming back and saying, we have $40,000 less than you, because I know that there are other people who are maybe smaller scale production companies who could do it. But I feel like just talking, talking is always the first step and being transparent with the client about the money and asking them, how could we get this down to a more appropriate number? Do we cut some of the deliverables? Do we, you know, maybe reduce the amount of B-roll we need or reduce the amount of editing if we're doing posts? There's always ways to figure things or out. Or locations. I've yeah. done that before because it's the difference between needing an extra grip or more gear could yeah. be that you want us to light a different room for every single person. We have to clean up all the gear, push carts over. So right. then it becomes, okay, we might need to rent a second, you know, second set of lights so we can yeah. like be pre-rigging so we can hit the timeline. And it's always, I feel like it's always good going back to transparency because if you discuss that before you're on set when you're, they might just say, oh, we don't care if there's different rooms. That was you guys that wanted like a room for, sure. you know, they, they might be happy with, oh, you can do it in the same room and just give us, Two looks, flop the key, right. and then it's like, okay, cool. We just saved almost $1,000 here. Well, that, well, that's the other problem, too, that I think on our end of things, I think a lot of producers, production companies, and even independent filmmakers who are maybe, if you're doing this, as more of a one-person band kind of a thing. We make a lot of assumptions of what the client 
or agency wants. I know, like you said, how a lot of times I'll really beef up that client experience on set, which does affect things from the budget standpoint. But maybe on these smaller, mid-sized projects, you know, one person from the agency is flying in. I'm thinking about the project that you and I did last summer where they told us one person was flying in from New York for it. So again, that switch goes off in my head of, oh my gosh, I need to have craft services. I need to have a separate client monitor. I need to have maybe a client AD. And suddenly that affects this already small budget. And when I talked to them about it, they said, no, 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 no. The person we're sending has a ton of production experience. She knows all of what happens on these small budget sets. We'd rather you spend the money on things that are going to end up on screen. That was a perfect example of where I assumed I had to spend that money on that client experience because they were sending somebody to set, but they would much rather have it as part of the final product. So it, again, talking solves everything, I think, in a lot of ways. And where do you see that in screen the most? So if, like when they make that comment, we want the budget to go on screen. Is that just making sure you have like a certain camera and lens package you want? Is it having making sure you have a grip truck instead of the DP just bringing like a couple lights or? Yeah, again, it's project to project. I think you've got to feel out those things. Like take, for example, our hand manufacturing, mm -hmm. dark facility, right? A lot of overhead fluorescence or something crazy. Um, if there's overhead fluorescence, there's not too much we can do. We can add to it, right? But we're not going to do much control in a big wide shot Unless in the we factory. The yeah, it's we're not going to have the time with yeah. a mid-sized project, project. There's no way. So that's a great example of maybe putting more money into the lenses and less into the lighting package just because there's so only so much we can do. Or maybe that's a great example of throwing more money at the supplemental camera gear, making sure you've got a kick-ass handheld rig, you know, making sure that... A gimbal. Yes, a, that's perfect, as opposed to other things. So it's all situational, but then it's also about telling the client why you're spending their money where you're spending it, mm -hmm. right? You can flat out say, I took the money and pumped it more into the camera gear because I'd rather have dynamic shots following factory employees as opposed to trying to control the lighting, which I know we don't have control over because you told me it was a really busy factory setting during our pre-pro calls. Yeah. Those are the types of conversations you need to be having with your client in order to justify the budget and justify where your money's going. And I think that's where you become more valuable. It's like where you become a professional. Like one example <laughs> I have or when yeah. I remember where it really clicked for me of like budgeting and how much money you have to spend. And when we did the shoot in Las Vegas for Caesars and we had to go around, I just remember at first, this was before like LEDs were the lights everyone uses right. only. But I was like, how am I going to do the biggest job of my career without HMIs? Like, I, you know, I, I don't know. But I realized I was like, okay, we don't have the time. I can't like do these huge lights and then be like, all right, Andy, 15 minutes to cool down. And then we'll so I spent, we spent more of the money. We didn't get like the best lenses ever. I think we just got some Canon Cinema Prize. But anyways, the point is, because I looked at the whole project and like what was actually going to be done, I was like, this is where the money needs to go. Like more like lightweight LED lights so we can move quicker. Right. And that ended up working. So and then it to, goes through the whole project, I feel like. To piggyback on that budget real quick, that was a tough one and an interesting one. Because in Las Vegas, you have no control over the locations. So I didn't have to pay for locations as a producer. But what could I do to make those locations sort of look as glamorous as possible, right? We had a really good hair and makeup team on that. We hired the best and spent a lot of money on it. We didn't have a huge crew because we physically just couldn't have a big crew. They told us in those pre-pro conversations you need to maintain a small footprint. That is the most important thing because we cannot disrupt actual customers at these places. Uh, so, okay, if we don't have a big crew, where could we pump really good amounts of money into? Talent, right? We sourced some pretty decent talent on that one because we only had a limited amount of time at each location as well. So you want that talent to be on and ready. First take, they hit it out of the park. Mm -hmm. So just things like that of yeah. really... I almost feel like really examining just situationally what's happening, talking to your client. And again, a lot of times on the larger jobs, the traditional flow of things will be 
you submit a reel. If you get into that sort of triple bid process and you're making up the bid for the job, you're inevitably having a conversation with the agency about the job, talking to them from a producing standpoint, your director's talking to them. You can ask budget questions during those conversations. And a lot of people are nervous too, and I don't think you should be. You can have those hard questions about where do you see the majority of the money being spent? What's the single most important thing about this job to the client that they've talked to you about in those pre-pro conversations? Because they might say, the client is so hell-bent on getting the best locations possible. They want the locations to look amazing. So then suddenly, you're going to put a big fat line item in for locations to impress them on that bid because you knew that they said something. So it's just, it's all about talking. It always comes yeah. down to talking yeah, is what I think. Yeah, the money in the right spot. Yeah. And I think it's funny. It goes, it, it circles all the way back to client services that on the end because you're yeah. targeting what is their biggest pain point or what's most important to them. Sure. And making sure that the money is is covering that. Yeah. So what I want to do is a lot of companies, I think a lot of times, especially for the small to mid-sized budgets, maybe those B2B videos or like you, our example, don't exactly know sometimes how much things cost. I mean, you've been in the same boat as I have where sometimes we send it over and it's pure sticker shock because they think that video example that we've been talking about with three interviews and some B-roll could cost $3,000 mm -hmm. and they don't understand everything that's needed to it. So I kind of want to put pen to paper and yeah. act let's actually make this budget out for that example. Let's do it. So again, just to sort of put yeah, down, down the little project here. Too. Yeah. So so just just to to give a recap of what we're going for, we want a single day shoot, so ten hours. It's going to be local to Pittsburgh. Front half of the day is B roll in a manufacturing facility that makes hand casts. The second half of the day are three interviews within that same facility of three different people in the company that they're providing us. So we don't have to pay talent fees, for example. And let's pretend we want to get roughly like two thirties out of it, of okay. different people talking on camera intermixed with B-roll about the joys of manufacturing hand casts for children. Don't bring the children in. Do <laughs> so it's tiny hands. Oh my, no, it's not. <laughs> I'm just being hand silly. Hand factory. So real quick to get into budgeting software. The example we're using here is just a Google Sheets template that a friend of mine gave me years ago that I've been using ever since for those really kind of smaller budgets, just because it's easier to use. But okay. there, if you just Google budgeting software for Excel, for Google Sheets, there are so many out there. Some are free. Some you have to pay for, like Hot Budgets is a really popular one. I think it's like $100. The other thing to know that's really important is when you get up into the more, we'll call it big kid shoots, right, where the budgets are a little meatier, there are certain templates and formats that people come to expect to see. So if you don't use one of those, you might throw them for a loop a little bit. So when you get up into more of the larger shoots, uh, the AICP budget forms are a little more standard and people will come to expect that template. And they uh, just go through a little more line items. They break things down even further. So I would encourage people to look those up on the larger budget okay. stuff. But Is that I an association of independent commercial producers? I believe so, yes. AICP, I'm bad okay. I'm bad with breaking down what no, letters that's make. Fine, that's fine. <laughs> so again, for this example, we're using we'll call a smaller budget yeah. template. So let's just start filling stuff out. So on the first portion here, I have creative services, which are kind of some of those pre-pro items. Okay. So let's pretend there's a scout involved to this, right? You and I have to see this facility to sort of figure out the best places to film. So we're gonna start with me, Andy, um, and let's go into director prep. So I usually charge anywhere from, we'll say 95 an hour on this lower budget stuff. So we're gonna put in 95 as the day rate, and it's gonna be hours here. Uh, sometimes this doesn't auto-populate. So for a scout, I'm gonna say four hours. Now I know some people charge a full day rate for scouts for this case, because we're gonna say it's a little lower budget. I'm going to ask people to do an hourly rate for me. Okay. All right. So there's that. You'll notice I'm not marking things up yet. Okay. So DP Scout, that's you. So what are you charging for a pre-pro rate? I think around you, the same? Yeah. Well, yeah, somewhere around there. I'd say like 60 to 70 an hour or something. Yeah. 75 yeah, an hour. Somewhere in there. All right. And so it depends. And I would say even just to give my honest feedback on a project like this, if 
if they're scout, you're renting gear, all that. Like usually it comes to where we're right in the ballpark of what I charge, but I'm not going to say no if it's like off by a couple hundred bucks. I know. You know, know, yeah. Yeah. Like if it's a lower budget thing, sometimes I'll just throw the scout in because it's for my own sanity. As I was just going to say, sometimes with the scouting, I mean, I know even like ASCs and huge DP, like if they don't have the budget, they'll still do it or they'll try to just because it makes you that much better on the day. So it kind of depends on the project. Well, that's something else that kind of falls into transparency on our side of things and not the company side of things is with you. Like, let's say I hire you for this job. Right. And I say, Rob, the all in budget for this with me trying to make a profit. I'm making this up, of course, is twenty three thousand dollars. You're going to probably say, well, not probably, but you might say I'll throw in the scout for free. I understand. Yeah. that this is a lower budget thing. It Sometimes it really helps you as a producer to be transparent about the all-in budget with your crew because then they might be more forthcoming with certain things. And it's not like you're asking for free favors. It's more just saying, hey, here's the situation of this job. What can you do for me on this one? Knowing that on the big one, I'm going to pay you for the scout. Yeah, and honestly, even in a selfish way, there's sometimes I honestly can say, Okay, I won't get paid on the scout, but because that money was saved, now you're able to get a PA, right. which will make my life easier, exactly. which means I get a coffee in the afternoon. <laughs> it <know>? all <laughs> There's always a back and forth. There's always, if you're saving money somewhere, you're spending it somewhere else. It's nice. So going back to our example, do we want the gaffer on the scout? I'd say for this one, no. We'll okay. Skip it on that Is that because we can't afford it? Yeah, let's just say we okay. can't. We'll put the money somewhere else. If it's just that kind of stuff. Let's just see where we get to. Okay. A couple other pre-pro things on a lower budget thing. I know this sounds silly, but my client's going to want physical binders on set. That's a client so, services, yep. man. So let's go just 250 So that is explain that. So you print out everything that anyone on set needs to see. I and wish, it's in a nice binder. I wish we were beyond the days of having to print things out on set, but a lot of people still like physical handheld materials. So for our example, a run of day our schedule, our call sheet, pictures of the three people we're going to interview, Mm -hmm. the locations that we decided on during the scout, all those minute things are going to get printed out into a three-ring binder that's going to look nice. There's going to be maybe, if we're doing interviews, it's always good to have a page for notes that they can take notes during the interview to jump in with, oh, I want to ask them about that. So yeah, making little binders out for the clients goes a long way. I know it sounds simple. I know it might sound archaic. People love it, though. People love it. That's great. Okay. We're not traveling anybody in for this. Even though it's a real world shoot and it's a smaller shoot, I'm going to line item some storyboards for this. So I'm going to put down boards because not to insult our client here, but let's pretend they are the types that can't pre-visualize very well. In doing those pre-pro calls, I realize, uh uh-oh, they are not getting it. They They are having a hard time visualizing it. So it's a low amount compared to what you would spend on a larger production, but 500 bucks for some really simple storyboards that I'm going to print out and physically mount to a poster board on set so the client can see it and understand the run of day of where we're going is going to go a long way. That 500 bucks is going to be worth its weight in gold when we're standing on set. Well, and especially if you don't have a producer on set, that kind of helps keep keep it going. Yeah. Okay. So we're only at like 1430 for our pre-pro. That's not too bad. So let's go down to gear. So let's say you as the DP, I'm going to use your FX9 camera package. So with lenses, not accoutrements, we'll call it, not those extras, how much do you want to charge for this job for camera package, lenses, sticks, that kind of stuff? It'd probably be like, usually ends up coming to about 600. Oh my God, no. Oh, Six, no. 600 is great. But also if they want two cameras, you know, for the interviews, it depends. Do we want two cameras? I don't, I don't know that we do yeah, for Okay, this. just do the single cam. All right, so single day, 600 bucks. I usually line item 600 for a smaller to medium-sized job for accessories. That includes follow focus, yeah. Teradac, things like that. Monitors. So, yeah. So and that gonna, can even be a little high, so we might even be able to come down on that if we need to. I have to tell you, this line item right here, camera accessories, is sometimes the hardest thing to justify to a client because they yeah. don't sometimes understand why those things are necessary outside of the camera package. So again, it's just going back to having that knowledge and knowing how to justify things. Um, I do love wireless though, when you can sit them down on a comfy couch with a monitor and no cables everywhere. Yep, we want a client monitor. So let's go 200 bucks. You think that's average? Okay. 
Um, it could even be a little high too, depending on which one we get. But all right, grip truck. Grip truck. I'm gonna say I'm gonna go eleven hundred because it's gonna be a thousand dollars, but I need fuel. So I usually average okay. about a hundred bucks for that, and then it comes in lower, and I'm excited. Um, we don't need a dolly on this one. Right. Um, what other is there? Any other grip gear we need for this job? No, I mean usually the thousand truck package we get locally has that, and like that's like a one ton right yeah a little more it than would a one be ton. more of like if we saw something and they were us trying to battle the sun or we, you know we wanted right. some more control light, yeah. something like that or like crazy i've been on the shoots where they want you to block out something in the showroom or the warehouse so you would have to rent like 20 foot by 40 foot yeah so that'd be a specialty it's, thing but it's, we'll it's also we don't need that it's also really important to remember we're in pittsburgh in San Francisco, these numbers would be wildly different. Definitely. I find that grip truck is one of the biggest variables that you get city to city because everyone has their own rates for the grip truck because it's what's on it. From 500 to 2,500, I, mean, honestly, I feel like I've seen. Here in Pittsburgh, you and I work with a gaffer who has a great grip truck that for a mid-sized job would give us that price point that would come with a lighting package and, as well as the grip gear. Yep. Sometimes once you get into a la carte, it's more expensive. You just got to city to city. Yeah. For our example, this is what we're going to do. All right, so let's get into actual crew. We said that there's a DP, so how much are you charging me for this job for a 10-hour day? I'd say 1000 is a good starting point, give or take. Oh, my God. Okay. Well, I'm just... I'd say usually it ends up, like, for me, to be honest, like, my rates are fluctuate from 800 to 1200 I'd say, for my DP Because it depends rate. on the city. It depends on what you're doing. Yeah, because some yeah. jobs, if it's, you know, if it's like this where it's literally – almost like a, a mini doc style where right. you're doing interviews and running yeah. around, I'd say you're falling closer to the 800. But the specialty jobs and you're doing the gimbal all day, you have a exactly. gimbal on for 10 hours, and it's like, okay, not many people are doing this much. Yeah. You have 650 for an AC. So I would say 700 gaffer for our for gaffer. No, we just need one grip. I think usually if you have... No, it's more than that. Oh, is um, it? Now? Yeah. Oh, so I would say 650 for a grip. 650 mm -hmm. for a grip. Depends who you hire. They're worth it. If anyone it. needs a grip for 650 day, hit me up. We forgot about hair and makeup when we were talking. Oh, no, that's important. Definitely. Yeah. Um, with, Especially for this. For a lower stressful job, so just three interviews, they're not doing any. They're it's just more just touch ins, ups. Yeah, touch it's ups like in the morning. Professional people are already there. Maybe they have a couple wardrobe options they brought. But I'm going to go. Hair and makeup is like giving suggestions. I'll do 600 with Kit. It could be more. Like I said, sometimes this one doesn't auto-populate. That's why I like, yeah, I feel like the hot budgets. More. All right, so um, sound, I'm going to go 650. We forgot about sound gear, so I got to go back up there. Which would probably be another six or so, five, six. Uh, yeah, so I, I usually budget like 1000 to 1400 for sound. Me too, with gear. Because with I would yeah. say that the typical gear package is a boom, two lobs, time code jam is sometimes a little extra. A slate is sometimes a little extra. Obviously, the mixer. Um, so if we have their rate of six fifty, let's go six hundred on the gear. Yeah, I think that's that's a good. Now you notice I'm not doing a markup in here, and we'll explain why in a okay. minute. Okay. Okay, so we don't need wardrobe. PA is now our two fifty to three fifty. I'm gonna go two fifty yeah. for a ten hour. I'm doing two fifty. Yeah, it just depends. We don't need an AD. We don't need crafty. We don't need locations. I don't know why location's on there twice. Now, we, do you put food budget in here? Is that Yeah, that, we're oh, down there. Okay, this is crew member. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. What crew are we missing? I don't think anybody. So, so we are missing one person. Me, the director. Oh, you didn't put you in there. No, yet. so here's why. Ooh. On a lower budget job, am I making my money by the markup of the total production? And am I still charging? Am I doing a chargeback system for myself? So it just depends. So for me, for this type of job, for a day rate, it can be pretty low. I'd probably put like 1200 Okay. So. Let's do that for now. Because there are some jobs where if I'm showing up as the director, but it's a lower budget, I won't necessarily charge a day rate because I'm making enough on the back end as the production mm -hmm. company that I feel okay with it. Yeah. The directing services come with it. Obviously on a bigger job, like a big, big job, that's a whole other ball game. You know, 
as a director, I'm getting a certain percentage of lines A through K on the AICP bid form. I mean, it is wildly different. Yeah. So we're really talking small to yeah, medium definitely. size yeah. stuff here. So let's go down to production support props and wardrobe. Craft costs. So this is like, I'm assuming I'm sending the PA to Costco level. Uh, probably 250 bucks, don't you think? Yeah, and that's, so that's like you get bottled waters, some sparkling waters, some yeah. snacks on set, granola things, some healthier stuff. Yeah. breakfast so you have a little breakfast for the crew is right. that like a panera order is that your go-to or something like that unfortunately on these small ones is it, i say unfortunately because every time you find a really good breakfast place in another city it feels like they can never accommodate for some reason i just i've had the worst luck with mm -hmm. breakfast places on a medium-sized budget like let's say i'm like a 75 to a 120 k range I have a craft services person on set, no matter what, and then they're handling breakfast on my behalf. Yeah. Lunch usually comes from an independent company. I tend to over budget for lunch, so I'm going to go 600 in this case. But that's a good thing to over budget in here because if if you are battling budget, can't you say like one? I mean, I've been in the conversation where they're like, okay, well, you just you don't have to pay for lunch for like we'll just do we'll handle lunch. Like instead of them paying us to do lunch, they'll just yeah. cater it themselves. Exactly. Or just handle it. We'll still get like the sometimes though, if they but... offer to cater it themselves, I step in and say, what? "I'll handle it for my crew." I don't want cold pizza. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, we have leftover pizza from yesterday. <laughs> we don't need any props or wardrobe for this, but those are two line items, especially on the small to medium size ones that can sometimes add up really quick. And it is a great example of setting or not setting expectations with the client. Because for all you know, you don't line item that, you don't mention it in your, your bid sheet, and then they suddenly say, well, we need our CEOs in purple shirts. And you're like, what? I can't get that unique specialty purple shirt unless I rush ship it and blah, blah, blah. It's just things like that. Mm -hmm. Again, having those discussions. There's nothing mm -hmm. else in here that I feel like I need to line item. Yeah, and there's obviously, let's say for this one, they're doing the location on at their office, but so in no general locations. in Pittsburgh, like what is your to rent, you know, for a house from share grid or to rent a space? Yeah, I gotcha. What do you generally put in the back of your head for a butt? For, for, for a house location or something that's not a business, I usually estimate 1500 Okay. Um, for a 10 hour day. And then for a business, assuming it's not a massive business, I'm usually around two to three K. Okay. So like, and then I think that it's important to know that the size of the house can sometimes bump it to two K to three K as well. And studios around here are like 1500 to two K a day. It just depends. Like some of the larger studios, uh, especially if you get some of like the soft lights included on the grid, that's around 1500. Um, it depends what you add. If you add green rooms, if you add other spaces, it can bump up to two K and some studios can be, 800 to 1k okay it just depends cool i uh, just something good to throw in there if the person doesn't have a location just sure a general I, idea. I also think it's important to know that when you're budgeting out locations a lot of times it's good to just call them and ask for the price sometimes you know specialty locations can add up when you don't expect it you can have in your head 2k for location and then unbeknownst to you that gas station's charging you five grand because they have to shut down for an hour just depends right sometimes yeah. restaurants restaurants are can be wildly expensive when you least expect it you get those before they open though we've been on some of those yeah or on the day that they're closed during the week yeah. sometimes helps it's funny how it can go the opposite i did i produced a thing for gnc that photo shoot that was multiple days and i had all this budget for locations because they want all this park and outdoor end up being free. Yeah, that's Pittsburgh great. Pittsburgh Park. And then What's conversely, up? we, you and I just did a shoot about a year ago that had police stations, fire stations. Those were wildly expensive. Yeah. And that's okay. But, you know, within that location, we got the vehicles. We got a lot of props from them. Police, right? They K-9 dog. Right. So it kind of actually helped on the other end of things. Just depends. Yeah. Um. So for our example, we're not going to do any post. Okay, yeah, we'll just keep it the production. Right, but remember to really outline your post if you are doing it, not just your editing rates. Explain your, that, yeah. Your audio mixing, your sound design, your color correction, uh, your graphics or VFX, even if it's just animating a logo or putting some simple type on screen and you want to outsource that. Closed captioning. 
transcription services yeah. if it's interviews. Like in this case, we might want transcription services on there because it's going to make it easier for me to edit, but we're not including posts. So. Yeah, no, no, that's a good thing to keep in mind because yeah. I think the goal with this episode too, not only to show the prices, but but to get the right mindset of how to price so you're right. not cutting yourself short. Because I know with editing, when I, not that I edit a ton, I do, but when I first started editing for like clients, I would be like, oh yeah, I get this done a day or two. And now it's just like, you know what? I'm just going to estimate almost a day just to like get the project started. Yep. Because it's like, it's easy to just be like, oh, just go right in. It's just cutting these scenes. It's like, no, you got to, first you got to get on hard drives, organize it so you don't lose it, right? Yeah. Go through things, actually understand that. So yeah, I think with that, it's just like almost, I feel like what I'm taking away from how you're handling this, which is great is you almost take a step back and try to look at a bird's eye view of the whole project. Absolutely. Like everything that's that's involved and obviously keeping in mind what's most important to the client, what's like their biggest pain points that you need to make sure you're sure. not like annoying them by not doing or ignoring. Yeah. And then just to get into our budget to wrap it up a little bit. Yeah. So we're not doing post. Uh, we're also not doing talent. I find talent to be one of the most expensive things on a set. And I also find it's where there's the one of the most disconnects between you knowing maybe talent costs and your client not understanding talent costs. Um, it can range for as much as you paying, you know, maybe your friends to show up to set for a hundred bucks to act, to act as extras in our factory setting. Or it could be hiring professional talent who are going to do lines on camera for a couple thousand dollars plus a 20% markup for the talent agency you're using. Yeah. And again, it's just talking to the client, right? It's telling them just how much talent costs are and being transparent about it. But again, that's where I find that there's a big disconnect. A lot yeah. of times. So we don't have talent costs in this example. So drum roll for our final cost. So that's pretty cheap. That's actually really cheap. But what we haven't done yet. So wait, so it's 11280 Okay. So what no this markups, is, though, right? exactly. So this is my out-of-pocket cost on here, what I'm spending to make this shoot happen. So there's a couple of different ways that we can talk about markups that you, as that producer, need to make money on it. Okay. So I used to operate on a 70-30 attitude where I would, if they would come to me and they would say, Let's use $100,000 yeah, to make, make this it easy. easy. We have $100,000. Mm -hmm. What can that buy us? I would operate on the 70-30 where I'm going to take 30% of that $100,000 and that's whoop, going into my pocket. But does that's, it make that noise? Yes, that it happens? does. It makes okay. the delicious slide whistle money noise. <laughs> but what that's buying them is my services as a production company. So I'm doing payroll. I'm covering the insurance. I'm doing all of these numbers for them. I'm setting up the production, right? I'm acting as the production company. You're emailing all the crew before. Exactly. You're putting it together so everyone shows it up together. at the right place, right. right time. Right. That's what that 30% is buying. them, And then 70% will end up on screen. So that's paying for the people. That's paying for the post. And then I tell them what they can get with that $70,000. Here's what that's going to buy you. It's going to buy you one day of production. It's going to buy you this many crew. It's going to buy you this many outputs. Um, sometimes they know the outputs and they know they have a hundred thousand dollars. So that way I'm going to fit into that box. But sometimes more times than not, they have no idea how much money they have mm -hmm. and they want to know, oh, this is going to cost me $11,280. Well, it's not. So now we need to take this and we need to add a 30% markup to it. Okay. And I'm not going to attempt to do fast math at that. So. Do you need a calculator? I'll just pull it up on my phone real quick. So point three times 11 to 8 zero equals so that's what i'm going to make off of this job okay so now you have 3, to ask 384 so now you have to ask yourself is that worth it i don't know if it is it might be but let's also ask ourselves what actually would go into me doing this job this sounds yeah. pretty low key yeah this sounds like i'm going to have a day or two of prep with the client we're going to have the scout, but the location's within 20 minutes of my house. I'm going to use my regular crew. So people I work with who I could send a text message to and set this up. There's no post involved. They're going to handle that themselves. And you do have a director rate included too. So you, right. You do so there's another thousand. Twelve. Yeah, I think you did. Twelve hundred. Yeah. Right. So forty five eighty four is. Yeah. So that's a pretty good payday for this level of a job, in my opinion. This is a low stress job mm -hmm. to me. But 
let's pretend I've gotten 20 emails from the client leading up to this. They wanted to have Zoom meetings every single time as opposed to things that could be handled over email. Suddenly that rate does not look that good. Yeah. Because it is a very needy client. So very it's time just, consuming yeah. on your end. So you as a producer just need to always kind of sit there and wonder if it's worth it and things like that. Maybe you mark this up more, quite frankly. And maybe you say to them, hey, this is going to involve a lot of logistical pre-pro because you've got a very busy factory and I have to visit multiple times and have and you want to have in-person meetings or things like that. Those are the types of conversations you just need to have with your client to tell them where the money is being spent. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you put in more of a pre-pro rate. Maybe you add on more hours for the pre-pro and then that'll get marked up as well. In this situation, if they came back and were like, oh, we were hoping under 10, like that's a big chunk less. So like, do you try to figure out a way to make that work or having the numbers in front of you, do you feel like you're already at the point where it's like, eh? I think if the client came back to me and said, I want to get this under 10, I would probably talk to them and say, are you okay with this looking a little more amateur isn't the right word. I wouldn't use that word to a client. Less cinematic. Though, less cause... cinematic. I still probably wouldn't use that word, but, but let's go with less cinematic because then maybe we could eliminate the gaffer, the grip, and the grip truck, unfortunately. And maybe this is one where it's me just doing interviews and you showing up with a camera package and like an, an AC. AC and a PA and yeah, and a PA. Yeah. That might get us under 10K. So again, this is a really small job we're quoting Yeah, here. well, this is good because I think these yeah. are the conversations. And even with that, where if it came to me and you were asking, hey, Rob, like going on this, this they're trying to, what can we do to shave costs? Right. My first thought is like, well, interviews then need to just be in the same location. You know, maybe we can flip the scene after the first two. So you yeah. get two looks for the three. So you're saving time that way. And then the B-roll needs to be more condensed. Because a lot of times the extra crew, you know, it's like, oh, man, another five, six hundred dollars. It's yeah. like, but that person just is going to save you like two hours of overtime. Absolutely. Because you're having us run from one factory to the next. You right. know, it's not next door. Yeah, We're yeah. all over. It's like you need those extra people and you can't rely on the client's people to pack your, you know, everything goes in such a specific place. Right. But going back to the markup stuff, mm -hmm. when you get into the much bigger jobs, the standard markup is 18% and 2% for insurance. That's pretty standard. Now, it's different on every job. Some companies charge more, some companies charge less. But typically that markup is placed. The only other thing I will say is from a producer standpoint, I find the smaller jobs like this tend to have the most difficulty with clients with justifying where the money goes versus the larger jobs or even the mid-sized jobs. Because to them, they might be a smaller company and that might be a bigger amount of money to them where they're doing the oh shit we've got to spend 10K and I thought this was going to cost three. And I know it sucks, but again, you just got to talk to them about it and tell them why it's costing that much. Maybe they wait till next quarter. You know, maybe they, they budget for it for next year. Yeah, because at some point, if you don't have the resources, the crew and the right gear, you're not going to make it look good. No, you know, there's no point in doing. Yeah, you need multiple people. I mean, it's it's always great when people pick work out of, on the website. Oh, this sure. is great. Da, 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 we want you to do this. It's like, that's cool, but it's like I had like 10 people around me like yes. working and an art director like building what you're seeing on set. Right. Like wasn't just because I'm so good on with a camera. Yeah, but I, but I think the takeaway is that typically on the smaller jobs, the markup can be a little bigger. And on the bigger jobs, the markup can be a little smaller because you're kind of making more money and there's way more people in play. Yeah. This has what, six crew, five yeah. crew? On a larger job that has 50 or 60 crew, right? the markup can be the traditional 18%. Gotcha. Because I, as a production company, are going to make more money off of it. Yeah. You know, off of a half a million dollar job. Yeah. So just wildly different examples. But again, this is great. I think the North Star is always about talking to your clients or the agencies about where the money is being spent. A lot of people watching this are probably in the boat where they're doing more of the three or four person crew, Right. And there might, they might be wearing a lot of those hats themselves. Even in those jobs, when the budget is only $10,000, just talk to your client. Tell them about where their money is being spent. You and I know a lot of people who do the opposite, quite frankly, 
who spend 30 and bank 70%. Yeah. And I think it shows a lot of Definitely. times. I'm not a firm believer in that. I think that, you know, part of the part of the reasoning for spending more money on set and having more money end up on screen is because you get call, hired again. You yeah. get called back, right? And that's really important. You want that's people true. to come back to you. That's that long-term relationship that you're forming because you didn't cheap out on something yeah. like not getting a good lunch for the client. Yeah, that's honestly. True. Well, dude, I, I love this. Thank you for diving in and going through. For those that are into it and, and liking this conversation, where where can they find you? Where are you most active online? Instagram, is that your most? I'm most active working in pajamas and slippers from my desk in my house. And you can see me through the window. No, um, <laughs> no, no. Yes. So I run my production company, Dessert Before Dinner. Um, you can find us at dessertbeforedinnercreative.com where you can check out all of our quirky work, a lot of it that you yourself have shot. You can also find us on Instagram at Dessert Before Dinner Creative. Okay. I always got to remember that creative. Dessert that. Before Dinner Creative. All right, I'll yeah. throw that in the link. And then, um, you know, I encourage people to reach out to me. My email is right on the website. Ask me anything and everything about budgets. I'm an open book when it comes to it. And I love answering emails from strangers in all seriousness. Dude, I love it. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming to the basement. Thanks Dude, coming on the show. I'm happy to hang out in your basement anytime. <laughs> Thanks for checking out On Camera, On Brand. This episode is produced by Motion, a podcast agency that helps B2B organizations create their own shows. If you enjoyed what you learned, check out more episodes at motionagency.io slash on camera on brand. 